Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the 10th Nor Northern Ireland Sheep Programme WebEx event, brought to you in conjunction with Caffrey, the Irish Farmers Journal, and Dumbia. My name is Daryl Boyd, Senior Beef and Sheep Advisor with Caffrey, and I will be your chair for tonight. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope that you can hear myself clear and enjoy the videos we're going to bring you tonight. Please be aware that you may experience some connectivity problems from time to time due to your own broadband speed. However, the event is being recorded and will be available on Caffrey's TV channel or Caffrey TV on YouTube, along with the nine previous uh, productions brought to brought before from the, the programme. Tonight, we're going to have a number of videos brought to you uh, from James's farm, and we encourage you to ask questions as you as you think of them, um, rather than keeping them to the end. So please submit your questions when you when when you feel like doing so, and that can be done with laptop users just using the Q and A icon at the bottom of your screen, whereas mobile users can access the Q and A option via the three dot icon, which will appear when you tap your mobile screen. Please, when you're asking a question, select the all panelists option when submitting, and we'll try to direct them to the uh, most suitable panelist. At this stage, I just want to uh, introduce our four panel speakers for tonight. Uh, working from the left of your screen to the right, we have Senan White, who is a beef and sheep advisor with CAFRI and is the program manager for the Northern Ireland Sheep Program. We have James McKay, a sheep farmer from Drum Drumquin in County Tyrone, who is a participant in the program. We also have Darren Carty, livestock specialist with the Irish Farmers Journal. And finally, Jack Fryer, who is also a beef and sheep advisor with CAFRI. In addition to this, as always with a lot of these online events, I'd like to give my thanks to Pamela Gardner, who is there in the background for any uh, technical issues we may stumble across. So what is tonight all about, or, or why are we running this event? Um, and there's probably two big things that are on farmers' minds at the moment. Well, the main thing probably on farmers' minds at the minute is getting water to, to livestock on their farms, given the current weather we've had this week. But outside of that, two big issues that have been there all year, and by the looks of it, going into to next year, is the rising costs of both concentrates and, and, and fertilizer. In conjunction with that, there's been a few reports of, of yews being below optimum body condition score, and the inclement weather that we had uh, in the autumn time, where there was a lot of rainfall, lower in grass utilisation. We wanted to use this webinar as a platform just to highlight some of the important management practices and provide information that should help farmers to deal with these conditions to ensure a high lamb crop next year at the lowest economic cost. James, as I said, is a sheep farmer from Drumquin in Tyrone, and James will provide us with a background to his farm as best as he can virtually, um, to his sheep enterprise, and to highlight some of the practices he undertakes in relation to preparing for winter feeding, uh, especially this year with the rising costs. Darren Carty is also available to answer questions in relation to the program as one of the project partners. And finally, Jack Fryer is going to speak um, on the basis of rationing, nutrition, feed rations, and what to look out for in a ration, especially given the increased cost of straits. That's by way of introductions completed, and I just want to hand over now to Senan uh, to, to incorporate the videos. Okay, thank you very much, Darl, and I hope everybody's well. Uh, these are all welcome here this evening. <clears throat> so, folks, just a wee quick run through what we're going to be doing. Uh, there'll be four videos, uh, and after each, I say, as Darl has said, I encourage you to send your uh, questions through the Q and A as as you see them. But we'll have opportunity after each video to uh, we'll answer some of your questions. So, there'll be four videos, and then we'll have the the presentation from Jack uh, on uh, feeding the the yo this winter. So uh, the finish of Jack's presentation, there'll be a couple of uh, slides that I'd be covering over, and then we're going back to uh, Daryl for the final questions and answers. So when those two couple of slides are finished, um, 
please stay on and that's where our questions will be so folks just a wee quick recap obviously for any hope you all have been uh, viewing these over the last nine webinars but these are the the focus areas that we start off with with the program and SH farm uh, had different areas to look at some had two or three areas and wanted to improve on but as i say what we're probably looking at this evening is you know honing in probably in soil fertility to grow grass and and four and five they're getting more out of grazing management and getting quality silage so that's kind of the two we're looking at this evening so say folks without that there i'll be passing over now and starting the the first video um with james's farm James, uh, you maybe just give an outline to your viewers here, a wee bit about the background of the farm in terms of the size and the number of stock that you're carrying and the general system that you're running. We're farming 130 hectares here, running from 300 foot above sea level up to nearly 900. Some fairly good lowland ground, probably 20 hectares. Then you're into improved ground that wouldn't be cutting ground, probably another 20. And then you're into semi-improved and rough hill grazing and heather moorland for the rest of it. And is it all is it all owned land, is it? It's all owned land. And is it fairly concentrated in one block? It's all one block. Right. And what numbers of stock are you carrying on that ground? There's 150 crossbred yews, mainly taxel to a horned yew, leaving you the hill tax yew. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be some hill tax to a taxel again if you quite their taxel yew. Mm -hmm. And then this year, there's some of them bred to blue face Leicester and kept on as replacements as well. Right, and it's all it's all home breeding coming through it's the system, all, is it? It's all home breeding, and then there's the 150 Perthios as well, and Right, right, right. And what's your system in general? Are you putting lambs away fat or under the store ring, or are you putting your mule yew lamb out to the breeding rings, or we? Probably killed over a third food on the year this year. We sold some of the lighter lambs at stores mm -hmm. and we sold, we retained a hundred yo lambs for ourselves and then I sold about 40 through the breeding ring again. All right, right. And the, those lambs would sort of be drafting like you're lambing down late March, April time, like we're at Upland Farm here, going into a hill farm. First draft away at the beginning of July and still some lambs remaining. There's right. still a dozen lambs or something left to go. Right. Probably the big thing that's been happening in the last month to six weeks, uh, probably the breeding season, like most sheep farmers. Um, tell us a wee bit about how things have gone and many, what type of rams you're running this year and how many ewes were going to the top. Rams went out uh, to the lowland flock on the 18th of October, I think it was. There was a Taxel, two blue leasters, a Suffolk cross blue leaster, and a Shirley went out. Taxel didn't get very many. He's mainly for the horned yews, but okay. it was just to make sure everything's working with them. Yes, yes. So you're, you're, you're breeding your hill yews a bit later, you're concentrating on your cross bed yew. Hill yews went out sort of 17 days. After the, oh. we had most of the lowland yews tapped, and then we put the rams in with the, the hill yews at that stage. Uh, there was three pairs of rams went out, a swale deal, and a taxel to the am. So you, you sort of, is, it, is the split lambing, is it sort of to suit the labour or housing facilities, as well as, uh, like, you know, it just, you're probably the only man here lambing night and day. Like, it's just easier to, to concentrate on one batch at a time rather than doing the two in on top of one another and then the availability of the land afterwards. It, suit, it, suits, the, it suits the housing. The, the house will hold about 250 euros, right. but the lambing pens sort of works better for a 20, 20, 25 a day maximum lambing. And if you, we found if you held the crossbred euros to when the blackfish are going out, You'll have a glut of yews come all at once. You right. could have 40 and 50 yews a day. You probably need double the ram power as well. You'd it's... probably need more rams, yeah, yeah, more yeah. labour at lambing time. Uh, the, the, the numbers have sort of stayed fairly static over the last couple of years, breeding-wise? Or... Yeah, sort of fairly static. We're 
over the last 10 years, we're probably up from about 220 when the shade went up, now to 300 or 310. Right, okay. So, so you're, you're coming towards the end of the tipping uh, season now. What's your sort of plan between now and scanning time? Like, when would you be thinking about scanning? Or will you scan both flocks together or will you do them separately? Or We'll be coming very near the end of tipping with the horn drums pulled out. They've been replaced with a blue lester and a taxel to sweep up. The swale deal's still out. Our other yos, the lowland yos, still has their rams with them just because the, the horn yos is out. So mm -hmm. if there's anything tips, we'll still be lambing anyway. Yes. Scanning probably lowland yos around that 16th, 20th of January time. Blackfish probably fortnight later, three weeks later. And given that your lamb and sort of late spring or mid spring, will you use those? Will they all go back to grass or will you keep maybe a few of the, the twins or any triplets if there is one or two of them about? Will you keep them in or at that stage? I'll probably end up housing all the lowland yews and possibly some of the horned yews. And I think definitely horned yews with a triplet or lesser conditioned twins or earlier twins will come in to fill out the house, right. take yews off ground. Right. The rest will go back to semi-improved hill ground. Okay. You sort of need to be saving some of that improved ground for post-turnout lambing, do you? For yeah, I'd be trying to save the, the lowland and the then buy fields that are, even they're not cutting ground still, get them closed off early for, for spring turnout again. Okay, thanks, uh, Sanon, for, for sharing that video. It gives us a good uh, introduction to, to James's farm and system, I suppose. James, just we'll maybe take one or two questions in between each video here. Um, you're the only speaker there, so they're all going to be directed at you, at you, I'd say. The first question here I have, uh, James, you mentioned the introduction or the use of swale there. Um, is that a new development or recent development in farm? And what's the reasons behind that? It's new this year. Um, trying to maybe increase the fertility through hybrid vigour. As some of you that have listened to the programme webinars before will know, we had an issue with barren rate on our horn yews. So we're trying to breed that out of them. Hopefully the, the hybrid vigour will give us a better, better scanning percentage and maybe less reabsorption of embryos in early pregnancy. Right, so it's just, this is your first year with them, so uh, time will tell how that works out for you, James. Um, and it kind of brings us on to the to the next question there, um, when you mentioned barn rates. Um, you mentioned scanning. You didn't say just what you've been, I suppose you haven't scanned this year yet, but what you've come to expect in terms of your scanning, have you improved scanning? This last couple of years, and and how have you done that? If you have, it's it has improved. Last year, off the top of my head, I think crossbred yews was in around the one point eight. Horn yews was less. Um, everything's now done. Both abortion vaccines, Toxo and Enzo, we tap on as hoggets, and then mineral drench and bolus as well with blooded yews and turned up selenium and cobalt deficiencies right well like uh it sounds like everything else in agriculture there's no single term it's just a, a multi-factor of number of different things working well to, to get that scanning up and all the best for this year hope you have another good good figure um post christmas We'll maybe move on to the, the next um, video, Senan. And as it's just a repeat, keep sending in questions, folks, whenever you think of them. You don't have to keep them to the end. Okay, Senan. Senan, uh, we were just talking to James there, getting a bit of a feel for the farm. He's telling us was if the time of year is coming towards the end of the breeding season. I think that's the same with the majority of the farms in the programme. And 
how is things generally gone? I know we haven't we not known to the scanning time, but no big issues to report. No, uh, Kieran, nothing. Uh, most of the scan, sorry, most of the tipping will be over now. Uh, one of the farms, obviously, last year is moving a bit towards April lambing, uh, so there was still a few left. But um, general reports shows in fairly good condition. Um, well, maybe slightly back in some of the farms, but I think that's been a, a result of the years been in it. But tipping's been going fairly well, and I think it should be. All but well, keep the condition right, should have hopefully a good crop. Very good. You're talking about condition there, like I suppose we're sort of three years into the programme now, like what, what has this year brought in terms of challenges for the farms? Like there's obviously the, 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 the big ones there, but what have the farmers been trying to, trying to deal with in particular? Well, obviously we can, we can chat about it a little bit later on, obviously the, the cost of things that everybody's experienced as well. Big thing obviously this year and it has been this last couple of years is the weather. I know it sounds, what can you do about it? There has been a fairly split east-west um, uh, divide. Uh, the west here probably had a very good growing year. Challenging to get the grass utilised. The east um, a lot drier and we're seeing dry, dry matter growth rates well, well back. You know, they say the grass is there but it's been a harder job to get it utilised. Uh, just one thing I would say on that, Kieran, when I have the opportunity is that the growth actually in this last week why has been fairly good mm. uh, in the last month or so. Um, you know, farmers may be, may be thinking, uh, we'll get the yields back out again, there's a nice bit of growth, but I would just like to say, I know James will be the same, once it's closed off, leave it closed off, yes. you know, for the, for the springtime as well, so yeah. that's been a big one. Another thing, probably on the lamb front, the kill-outs have been uh, fairly you know, up and down in some of the farms, uh, it's been a difficult year to get a handle on that. So um, I think James himself said some from 50 something down to 40 something percent, you know, so it has been a bit big. of a change, a big, yeah. Yeah, definitely a big change. So what we're looking there is basically for the farmers to handle the lambs more, weigh them more regularly, um, where they have the opportunity to have you know, more grass to, to finish them, to take them to those heavier weights. Yeah. When you say there about, you know, the grass growth coming into this time and a bit closing, and keeping the paddocks closed off, like those farms that were say that had the more issues with the drought, how are they, have they the fodder on farm this winter? Are they okay that way? Well, yeah, that's one of the things that actually has been a benefit of the programme that, you know, the, the value of, of cutting grass through throughout the year, measuring and cutting, they have that surplus built up. Yeah. Um, it's probably not as dramatic as some other years, but it definitely is in the in east of the province, in our areas where... So uh, they've been taking a few bales out here and exactly. there as the summer yes, goes on, where, where they could spare them, and that's coming back in yeah. now, the high yeah. quality forage coming back in. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you, you touched on there about your condition and, and breeding time, like, uh, is it, you know, everybody has a few light yews, but uh, is that linked to anything in particular? Like, uh, is it weather related that you're seeing those yews maybe been a bit under condition or is there time between now and February, March slamming time to get that condition back on the yews? You're, you're always going to have yews that, that are lower condition and all this, but this year has been very, very challenging. There's no question about it. But again, it is a bit of a split um, what I'm hearing. Like James, some of his yews are in excellent condition, some of the yews may be nearly too heavy, yeah. but just in the bad place to be. Uh, there's still time to do something about that. You don't want yews to go down anyway further, especially you want to keep them in good order. You know, things like if you have the opportunity a winter run may not be there. Opportunity to, like James's case in the Hillman, bringing in lick buckets, stuff like that there, energy buckets. Yes, that's yes. a cost. You want to keep that energy level up. You may want to reduce silage in early, um, and if needed, some meal in as well. So you want to keep that that yield energy level. You don't want it milking off and uh, repeat this. This, this would be the time to be addressing that yield condition exactly. rather rather than four or five weeks out from lambing time. Exactly. exactly. Too, too late at that too stage. Late at that stage. Uh, just on that, you know, touch there with the silage. The silage samples are all taken now on the farms. By and large, what's fodder quality looking like? Actually, given the year, Kieran, that was in it, um, very surprising that it was better than we were, we were anticipating. As I say, the weather has been quite inclement. There's a lot of cases of snatch and grab. Mm. Um, second cut probably drier than the first cuts. Uh, the energy levels, you know, very surprising. Upwards average, and I think the first cuts across the group was something like a 11 me uh, crude protein, 13 or 14 of some of them was lades, uh, nutrient detergent fiber, about 48 mm percent. -hmm. So. It's very, very pleasing that what mm. I've seen, given that you know reports that the energy levels are back a half to one percent, yeah. um, or one sorry, one energy level. Um, the farmers the have been you know trying to produce better quality uh, sage. On the flip side of that, then, you know, you talked about input costs. <sighs> We're probably ready to given our price on rations at the moment, like, but feed is obviously going to be a lot more expensive. Yeah. There's two bits to that silage is it can save you a lot of concentrate, but it takes a bit of management too that. You know, when they run up, that you don't run into lambing problems. Like, like, 
are you are you planning to do a few feed plans with the farmers in general uh, in terms of that silage or what is the pitfalls with it or what's the what's the big advantages of that higher quality forage well as i say but we're quite early for a lot of sheep farmers to take analysis as well, you know, so we will be reanalyzing um, okay. closer to the time. So, you know, and as you move through pits and through bales, that's going to change. So obviously, as we don't know what prices are going to be, no. um, which would be a magic wand, it would be a great thing if we did. But yes, we will be looking at that size. Coming closer to the time, six, six seven weeks out, uh, we'll be testing that size again. And, right. you know, the meal feeding is a relatively short period of time, so you know farmers don't don't want to get too tied up and too worried about that. You know, um, you know, you could be 25, 30 kilos, maybe even yeah. less. So okay. it's not a big lot in the overall yes. year, yeah. but that's why the, the value of sage sampling and uh, feed plan will be put in place later on. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. The farmers there that are in the program, you see the silage analysis is done. The scanning is the next big one. On the, the silage end of things there, and the availability of grass coming into the springtime, like would you recommend and scan as early as you can and try and pull out those barn yews and get them out of the system to free up grass for your productive yews, uh, in general, or like I suppose it's, it's horses for courses. But uh, what would you be advising to those boys in around scanning time? Definitely, this is going forward, Kieran. We've, we've all seen the predictions. You know, prices we're not too sure. We don't know what fertilizer is going to be. Don't know what meal's going to be. No room for passengers at any time of the year, and that's the one thing that the farmers have been very uh, forthright in doing. And you know, even starting off early in the year, culling as, as necessary, using the EID figures, using growth rates, going back and James in particular. Yeah. What is that yield wean? If there's any problems at all, away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cheers, Fat Senna. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Senna. Um, covered a couple of different points there in that video uh, mainly body condition score and um, silage sampling throughout the throughout the program I suppose the program it's, it's three years Senan. um this is this is the last year of it you, you've seen an improvement in, in silage quality across the program farms within three years it's not a case that everybody has reseeded all their silage ground they might have done some reseeding but what's the What's the main things that the farmers have done to, to improve that silage quality? Is, is it a mindset thing more than anything, or what have they done? Well, I have to say, Dar, the, the farmers were very forthright and very forward thinking at the very start. So, you know, some may not have had some accurate, up to date soil analysis. That was the, the fundamental thing we'll start off with to get the soil right, uh, soil pH, uh, MP and K right for the, the level of grass that they wanted to grow um that was the big one and obviously you know reseeding yes it's got to cost it but from that there you know it's been over 300 acres has been reseeded so it, it has been uh, well received as i said in the video i think it was something over 1200 1200 ton of lime was done to improve the grass quality and growth uh and also the farmers have actually been trying to cut that grass that bit better a bit earlier to get better quality silage so they have been even if it's only a fortnight you know they've been doing that as they go along and seeing the benefit of it yeah and that's that's what i mean make kind of mindset sometimes it's just getting that into your head that you have to go out early and almost plan the year ahead mm -hmm. to make your silage that sort of level of quality um he's mentioned body condition scoring quite a bit there too um Senan or darren yourself that's across the farms do you see uh do you actually see you know, yo's lower than what you'd expect. I know there's reports, but across the program farms, do you see uh, yo's in poor condition? Um, and off the back of that as well, how often would you expect farmers to be actually body condition scoring their yo their yo's? Well, I'd maybe take the first yeah, one just for the farmers. Yeah, oh, darn. Yeah. Uh, as I said there, yeah. it was a, a bit of an east-west divide, um, Darrell. And I'd say James's yews were, as you've probably seen them in the video there, they're in very good order. Um, while some of the farmers over uh, on my own side of the country here, it has been more challenging. The the, the, the rain hadn't been there. The grass growth wasn't there. So yews are back maybe a quarter of condition. Um, so that's that's really, you know, from the program farmers, what that uh, we experience with that. What we would be saying to farmers, and I have said to the farmers in the program, you know, any chance at all you get yews in, 
run your hand on them, get a get a handle on the condition as often as you can, and you know don't let them grow. So a bit more often, trying to get that into the into the, the management. I'd be darned. Yeah. But I'd also, but I'd also maybe just to add, Daryl, to that is that the quicker you can get in and identify yours that are maybe under condition or yours that are say at the right condition, it's really important this year to safeguard it because the way we're getting weather coming in extremes in the trench and rainfall, then followed by the sub zero temperatures we've had in the space of a week to 10 days, you could go from yours in optimum body condition to find yourself in a situation that's going to cost you a lot of money to rectify. And this definitely isn't the year where you need to be going in trying to rectify condition, <coughs> excuse me, as you're coming to late pregnancy, because that condition is worth so much now. So like, as Sinan said, you don't need to go to all your yours and be body condition scoring them all. But anytime you get them in and you can throw a handle on them and you can maybe pull out 10 yours or maybe all the yours, <clears throat> because definitely I think there's on a lot of farms, what you've seen is it's maybe the hoggets that have reared lambs or it's the older yours. They're the ones that are in the poorest condition at the moment. And they're the ones that probably need a bit of extra care. Like it's, it's just the quicker you can get in, yeah. that can't be stressed enough. I think this year. Now's the time to do it no later. And I suppose what you, you're jumping on your point as well there, Darren, it's always easier to maintain than to build condition. Um, no, in, in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll jump to the next um, one video here, Senan. Thank you very much. Well, James, we've heard a bit about the farm and how breeding has gone. Um, what about health in the flock uh, this year in general or the autumn time? Like, uh, how, have you, how are you fixed for fluke? Have you always treated before tip and will you do them again before lambing time or what's your plans on parasite control in general? Or? You always will fluke before they went out to the tip. They'll probably be done again now any time and then probably again once before lambing with maybe a different product uh, you know, night and actual type yes, yes, uh, to get a different product in. Yes. Mix, get a mix up with the kill, just rather. After they've been housed, and you should have nothing but mature at that stage. Right, yes. You should get a, a good kill or something like that. Hoggets were all done with both Enzo and Toxo abortion right, again yes. this year. Do you do, you do the use for uh, clostridial vaccines? Like, are you they're, doing that? They're in the system and they're done then pre lamon sort of four weeks pre lamon Four weeks pre lamon so you'll probably tie that in probably with a fluke drench maybe in around that time or? Possibly a fluke drench and a mineral bolus as well. Right, right, right. You're getting the mineral. Have you had an issue with minerals in the past or? Cobalt and selenium cobalt. would be two big ones here. Right. And would you have seen lamb numbers dipping on the back of that in the past or? Possibly lamb survivability lamb, right. has increased since we've, mm -hmm. since we've used the boluses but then we've started vaccinating as well for the abortions. Okay, so, so it's hard to pin it in exactly. It's hard to pin it yeah. exactly to where it is, but it's right. we've definitely less mortality in right. young lambs. You always, in general, they're coming in at the minute. Uh, you happy enough with the condition? Like you don't think they're being bothered? You're saying that they probably do something in around this now. It's not really showing on them, and that it's not showing in condition wise. They're probably as good a condition as they've been in a year, if not better. Right. <laughs> One batch away at winter grazing in very good condition on good grass. Should be enough to keep them there probably to January. Okay. The yews at home could be in the side of Christmas, depending on if there comes snow, starting probably house lowland yews and put hill yews away to that semi improved hill ground. Okay. And when your yews come in, those crossbred yews, will they just go on the silage only at that stage or will you try and restrict the silage if? They'll probably go into last year's bales. There's some of them, there's slightly less quality in them right. than this year's. So we'll try and get rid of last year's mm. bales first. Yeah. And at least if we have anything to carry over, we'll be carrying fresh silage over. Okay, right. And this Good. year's was the best quality anyway, so yes. we'll keep keep the better stuff to near lamon. Near lamon, yeah. You don't want to run into issues getting yours getting too fat. Generally speaking, uh, when would you go in, like, 
the concentrate meal feeding before? Would you sort of gone a month before or six weeks and would it be a flat rate type job or would you try and build those up? Or? Twins would probably be going in five, six weeks from lambing, depending on silage analysis and body condition. Starting at 0.2, two weeks later going up to 0.4 mm -hmm. and maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.6, up to 0 0.8, depending on what the what yeah. analysis is saying. Are you, are you just going to uh, using a nut that you're buying through a merchant? We're using a nut. Uh -huh. Just once a day? Twi uh, twice a day? Once a day at the start, and right. then once across sort of 400 grams, I'd be going twice a day. Right, okay. And the likes of the singles, would they be a couple of weeks later before you'd be feeling them, or probably could you four, even get away? Four weeks probably out for them. Four. Starting at point two probably and going to maybe point four, point five, depending on again mm. analysis. And I don't like not feeding them, but we would try to adopt anything to win, any triplets onto them on the to leave the singles going out with one. Yeah, so you'd want and the I, milk there. I found if you didn't feed them, you didn't have enough milk to yeah. adopt successfully. Very good. And sort of after lambing time, like you'd be lambing in, would you be trying to get your yews back out to grass as quickly as possible? Probably bulk of them will be out 24, 36 hours. They'll stay in the shed one night and out again then the next the next day. And at that, will they just go out the grass or will you feed them out in the field with a bit of trucks or a snacker or? They'll be going out. They'll have whatever grass is there, but it'll not usually carry them. So they'll be getting up on a kilo a mile in trucks. Right. And would you get away from that for about a fortnight or three weeks? Would you see grass starting to catch up to what the ewes are needing at that stage? Or would you have to go yeah. feed out for a month? Just depends on the spring. There's springs we could be up on six weeks feeding. There's springs you get away with three weeks. Mm -hmm. And Just would they be on the like your on your semi-improved ground, like your silage ground at that stage? Or in they'd, your be on, they'd be starting on the silage ground and the and by fields around the yard. Right. And, that's, and that's grass you'd have saved? Both saved it's, and... Uh, whatever early growth has come again. Right, very good. You've been trying to make as good a silage as you can. Have you seen that filtering through? Like, in terms of, are you feeding less meal than you would be doing maybe four or five years ago? I would say, yeah, we're feeding less less meal now. We've got a, we're making better silage. It's improving nearly every year this last few years. Yeah. Got into the way of making better silage, and it's... It's a sort of routine now, a bit of a habit, yeah. Sort of try to make a habit of it. Very I good. suppose the cost of fertilizers help making better stuff. Yeah. You can cut it that bit sooner. Yeah. Just on the fertilizer, like, uh, have you any fertilizer in store for next year? No fertilizer, not yet. but... You'll wait to see what the spring brings. See what the spring brings. Uh -huh. We're not we're not big fertilizer users, so a couple of ton, mm. either way, it's not... Yeah. Uh, any plans, you've been, any reseeding plans? You've been doing a bit of work in drainage and reseeding in over the years here. Is, is that something that's There's going to keep on going? There's seven acres that was to be reseeded this year that we missed and yeah. still is in grass, so we'll hope to get into it maybe June time, get grass and possibly a forage crop established in it as well for fattening lambs. Very good, very good. Yep. Thanks James. And we touched a wee bit on fertilizer. What have the program farmers been doing either this year and going into next year to try and reduce their reliance and possibly cushion themselves from the market volatility that's out there? Because who knows where fertilizer is going? But generally speaking, what are they trying to do on farm to, to set themselves up for grassland? Yeah, it is. Like it's a question the fellows are asking me, like, you know, what should I do? Like, you know, I'd love, we'd love to have a crystal ball and yeah. do something about it. Like, basically, sheep system 90 percent of our uh, feed comes in from grass so grass is the most important one in the whole lot um, from that there's soil fertility and getting it right so we're back to the basics here you know soil testing which they've been doing throughout the, the program as well lime big big major major one uh, over the, the lifetime of the program it's only three years but there's something like over 1200 ton of lime have been spread and james himself i think this year has spread about 80 ton uh, you know if that ain't right the rest doesn't matter yeah. so that's what we're pushing as well a few of the farmers now have actually got slurry 
analysed as opposed right. to just taking the, the book figures. Um, and it's quite surprising some of them that are sheep only systems have found very valuable resources in, in the slurry that they have. Um, and one particular farmer had something like per thousand gallon spread about 14 units of N, 14 units of P and 40 units of K. So it was very, very surprising and very, very pleasing that yeah, they produced yeah, yeah. it. What about, what about the role of clover? Has anybody put in greater emphasis on that or yeah. made, made a start to down that road? It definitely, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more emphasis on it. Obviously, anybody that's reseeding now, they're looking at putting a bit extra clover into the swords. Um, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be managed. It's not something that's just going to turn a light over. And it's, you know, when the spraying and, and the P and K levels right have to be done as, as equally as that there. On the fertilizer end, you know, some of the farmers are looking at urea and protected urea when they can get it for early growth. Um, you know, more strategic use of fertilizer, yeah. um, measuring grass, feeding the fields that are giving it back to you, the reseeds, your sedge swords, and your good perennial ryegrass mm -hmm. swords. So more strategic use of fertilizer. Yeah, I suppose that's probably a good point, like that fertilizer, dear and all as it is, you might as well target it to the fields that's going to give you that response, which is like you're saying, getting the pH right and the P and K's right, and it won't be an overnight thing. I suppose like there's been a bit of rotational grazing and things coming in to the programmes. Some are, have taken to it very well and some are multiplying it up, but like for somebody watching in tonight that's thinking, I need to do something along those lines, like is there any tips you could say to somebody that's starting out and maybe, uh, well, not necessarily saying a, a full-blown paddock system, but a few tips to get themselves started in the rotation of some capacity? Simple thing, go out and buy an electric fencer and a bit of wire. Like there was a saying one of the farmers says, I've never grown as much grass with wire as right. any fertilizer. You know, you start off start off small, you know, give the grass a rest. It doesn't have to be put a lot of money into it, but a simple reel system, simple paddock system, you know, or, or simple rotational yeah. system um, make a lot of difference. In terms of the reel, like are you getting away with three re strands of wire or <laughs> Some of the farmers are thinking, unfortunately, maybe five wouldn't be enough, you know, right. it all depends on your sheep. But generally, three is generally, three, three. you'll get away with it, but I know some are a bit more difficult. And how are they, how are they get providing water in that? Like, is it, is it, are they just going with a mobile drinking truck, so temporary until they've got a, they know exactly where they want to set up? That's what I say, like some just a cube on the, on, a, on the back of a tractor left into a bath. You know, you don't have to start that too dramatic. A lot of months have, uh, you know, ones that work with the EFS schemes, they actually have, you know, uh, drinking systems in paddocks as well already there. But, you know, water is no, there's no reason to not adopt a paddock system. Yeah, yeah, very good. Cheers, Senate. Thank you. Okay, folks, so that, that was the last of our, our videos. We still have a presentation on nutrition to come from Jack, but I'll maybe ask a few questions. Just we had two videos on the truck there before we, we get to Jack. Uh, the first one, Put to yourself, James, uh, it was mentioned there by Sennon towards the end there, what's the simplest step is to go out and get a mains um, or electric fencer uh, and maybe split up ground into paddocks in some way, shape or form. Have you attempted that on your own farm? And if so, how do you get on? Are any good or bad stories to tell? I haven't attempted it at home, but on the winter grazing ground, there's a mains fencer and we're walking down there a uh, sort of paddocky strip grazing type system. We're getting away with one strand with yews only, but it's about knee high. But probably right. could work for lambs. No, and I take it that doesn't work for all, given the breeds you mentioned. Does it work for all, James? No. Uh, it's only the taxel yews really goes to the winter grazing, but the, right. the horned yews would probably destroy it in about 15 minutes. I'd assume that. No, but um, no, thanks very much, James. But works well when it does work. It seems to be working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe another point, just maybe pick up yourself, Darren. The Senna mentioned having a crystal ball there about prices of fertilizer and, and other things. Given that, there's a lot of queries and talks last year of alternative fertilizers, if you like, and, and stuff that comes in cubes and whatever else, and I'm not going to mention anything in particular, but what's the story there, or, or what do you think you need to look out for as a farmer if you're being offered these things? Yeah, I think, look, uh, you have to be definitely quality, number one, uh, Daryl, and in cost. Like, uh, 
sometimes when you look at alternatives and you break it down, or even the example I've often sort of looked at, because it was a big one last year, is, is pig slurry. And there was people transporting pig slurry huge distances. But then when you looked at the value of the NP and K in it, they were actually cheaper if they went out and bought bag fertilizer. And it's no different with the exposed alternatives. It's to make sure that what you're buying is value for money. Because in any of these things that say the fertilizer is expensive, but just be fully sure that I suppose what you need first of all, so a synthesis side samples, then actually what the fertilizer is and what exactly it is that you're getting. Because I think in any of those you need a good analysis of exactly what is in the bag or in the cube and no different than if you're bringing in uh, pig slurry or poultry manure or anything is do the cost on it. Because if you're getting stuff, say, delivered into your tank and then you're spreading it yourself, and particularly where it went to paying for last year, just do the figures. Like as and said, slurry analysis is vital and it's no different with any type of fertilizer. Make sure that you know what you're getting and work it out in the value. There was a lot of talk, I know I'm sort of going off slightly about staying away from P's and K's last year. Long term, we'll probably have to get back to P's and K's. We could have used a lot of urea last year to try and reduce the costs. But just be careful if your side fertility is run down, particularly on silage ground, because we need to we need to keep that back up. And I would say, if I have to call it, that we won't see any big reduction of fertilizer costs for the first half of next year, because a lot of risk that's bought in is bought at higher prices. Yeah, and. It's especially worth considering when, when when you're talking about first cut and even second cut silage, the amount of K that, that's needed there for that. You know, you can't be forgetting. I know N's a limiting factor, but beyond that, you know, if you're efficient in any of those things, you, you need the balance of what's there, what's not in the ground. Um, Senan, just before we go on to Jack, maybe um, you'd mentioned about the, the slurry sampling there, um, some good results from that there. But and, and just going back to the silage sampling, how necessary is it, or how often would you get your silage sample? Because you know, sampling one bill maybe isn't a true reflection. What's the advice around that? Well, definitely, if it's a pet, at least do it once. And anyway, if you, you know, if you've never done it before, please do, at least do it once. Obviously, do it with um, as you move in. Um, if you know that you're, you're first and your second cut, you know you want to get those tested. If you're going into different uh, ages of bales as well, if it's you know new grass or older grass. But the one thing definitely you'd be wanting to do, in Darn Darl, is when you're starting to feed yos, whatever silage you're going to start to feed the yos on, that's your main block. Get that tested in plenty of time. So priority stock, whatever that may be. So it's not a big it's not a big job, you know. Um, but just do it, you know, when you're changing silages, first, second cut, but definitely when you're going to feed, start feeding yos, and that's going to be your main feed that you want to know what your what concentrate you need to go with that. So definitely at that stage, anyway. Right, okay, Senan. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Jack now, um, and he'll be presenting on nutrition. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Daryl, and good evening, folks. Yep, I suppose the aim for this section tonight is to focus on feeding the ewe this winter time, especially with the rising costs of meal, um, coupled with the decrease in the quality of silage after a difficult year in terms of growing grass with fertilizer prices and the weather conditions when trying to harvest it. So we'll move on. Yep. So overall, we will talk briefly about ewe white pot nutrition and late pregnancy feeding to reduce lamb and new mortality, examining the silage and the concentrates, and a bit about um, the cost of feeding meal this winter time. So just a bit about benchmarking. Um, benchmarking consists of both financial and physical reports being produced by individual farm businesses across the country, which are in business development groups. Um, in terms of sheep benchmarks, we have pulled out the average lambs reared per ewe for 21-22, which is sitting at around 1.53, but it must be noted this includes both ewe lambs and hill flocks. Um, I suppose overall we are seeing an increase in trend on this figure over the past 10 years, but if we are to focus on increasing in this number, nutrition must be right. So if we are aiming to achieve extra lambs per ewe, especially more on the lowlands, <coughs> an increase of 0.2 lambs per ewe would equate to an extra £23 per ewe output at today's lamb prices. 
Uh, yeah, this may not sound much to many people, but over a 200 euro flock, um, this would equate to about 4,000 x 4,600 pound extra output. So again, it must be noted if you want to increase output per you physically, you will need to be better nutrition and get nutrition right. Alignment is one of many factors that will affect this. Yes, yeah, so in terms of um, getting the feeding right in the last six to eight weeks is vital in influencing the lamb birth weight and viability. Um, I suppose it affects lambing difficulty and subsequently muller ability and plays a critical role in colostrum and milk supply. So here you can see a table um, and you can see the green column down the middle. This is where we want to be and this is what we call the optimum zone. Um, us as advisors would probably come across more over the years uh, are under feeding on the left or over feeding there on the right. Um, starting with under feeding, the impact of this is the increased chances of twin lamb disease due to a lack of energy in the diet. Um, there's also the risk of low birth weights, um, vigor and survivability of the lambs. In terms of colostrum and milk production, it will be reduced to little or nothing, and therefore this will impact on lamb growth rates further on. So on the other side of the table there, you'll see overfeeding. Um, this is not the year to be doing it, considering the price of meal. Um, we also have the impact of increased birth weights and then resulting lamb difficulties, and overfeeding is also a factor in increasing the chances of prolapses. Um, Overfeeding can result in the delayed onset of lactation due to stress of lambing, for example, and the stress can also affect the maternal bond with the lambs. Overall, under or overfeeding will have an impact on the output per ewe in terms of lamb numbers. Yep, um, this is a picture here you've probably seen many a time, but just to show that in the last 68 weeks, the rapid growth of a lamb inside the ewe and the impact this has on her rumen capacity, and then for the impact on reducing her dry matter intact capability of food. This, for, this therefore demonstrates the importance of ensuring she gets the correct diet formulated for her. You can see there in the picture on the left, the size of the rumen, that's the wee, uh, big pink thing, and the lamb at 12 weeks. And the picture on the right shows the rapid growth of the lamb, which is about 70% growth in the final eight weeks, and shows the pressure this is putting on the rumen, which decreases the size of it eight weeks later. So the feeding dilemma. Um, so just as I said, 70% of fetal growth um, takes place in the final 68 weeks of pregnancy. In this time, energy demand goes up, but ewe's appetite drops by 30% due to reduced um, capacity of the rumen. Therefore, we need to supply this ewe with as much energy in each mouthful, and this will be achieved with concentrated energy in terms of meal. A size alone is seldom adequate, especially this year with results already coming through that we are seeing. Also with, just go back there with you again, sorry. Also with feeding um, this winter, split batches into scanning groups and take into consideration the body condition score as has been highlighted earlier and pen batches accordingly. Another thing that we should be considering, for example, if you have thin ewe expecting twins, you could always put her in with triplets or if you have a fat ewe expecting twins, you could put her in with a singles just as a help um, to, to avoid underfeeding or overfeeding of these individuals. In terms of the importance of colostrum, one of the main factors in getting nutrition right during the final few weeks of pregnancy is to ensure the development of good quality and quantity of colostrum. As you will know, lambs are born with no immunity to disease and therefore the initial immunity comes from antibodies in the colostrum. Therefore, it is important that ewes receive adequate feeding during the final period. If not, the colostrum quality and quantity is poor. There is a risk of watery mouth, scars and other issues. So overall, we are aiming for the three important cues, and these are firstly um, quick. That's the first cue. Um, in regards to the lamb receiving colostrum, you want it to get it within the first six hours of its life, as in this period is this when the most antibodies are absorbed across the stomach wall into the bloodstream. So just a strong, healthy lamb up and suckling within 15 minutes of birth has a 90 to 95 percent chance of still being alive 90 days later. Um, the second cue would be quality. You want to ensure um, the colostrum is of top quality, 
as these contain more antibodies. And finally, the final cue is quantity. So regarding a five kilogram lamb, for example, it must receive at least 250 milliliters within the first four to six hours of life. And in total, it should receive one liter of colostrum in the first day of its life. Uh, this here is a table of results of a study done several years ago on black face ewes showing the impact of well-fed or underfed diets had on two batches of ewes. Um, the batches were both expecting twins as shown on the table and the difference of weights of the lambs at birth can be shown. Um, you can see there that the well-fed ones were just short of eight kilograms in total for the two lambs and for the underfed ones the resulting weight of those two lambs was six and a half kilos. And the two columns on the right hand side, in terms of colostrum production, you can see that one hour post lamin, the well fed batches produced 715 milliliters compared to 160 milliliters of the underfed. And as you can see clearly, the underfed ewes will more likely not be able to produce enough colostrum for her lambs to ensure immunity transfer in that important first, first six hours of life. In terms of 18 hours post lamin, you can still see the underfed ewe will not be able to provide one liter of colostrum to each of her lambs and will more likely only produce around 1.3 liters in total in the first 24 hours. I suppose this is probably a better way to officially put across the results of the study as shown one hour post lamin and the colostrum produced. Um, you can see on the left there is what 160 milliliters of colostrum looks like in an underfed ewe in comparison to 715 milliliters produced by the well-fed ewes. So overall this picture would be a good demonstration of why this winter you should not try to cut corners on the diets of your ewes to reduce feed costs and you should make sure that you have the correct diets formulated before late pregnancy in terms of concentration ration and silage quality being offered. This uh, slide here, um, I suppose, talk about um, concentrates versus silage. Um, as stated earlier, with the rumen being reduced in size, it's easier to get energy into the use with concentrates compared to silage. Basically, concentrates have a dry matter of around 86% dry matter. And this is where all the feed feeding value is, as there is no feed value in moisture or um, water. So as I said, it is easier to get the energy into the ewe with concentrates than it is with silage. Um, here, um, in terms of the ingredients you should be looking for in concentrate feeds, it's important that you consider what is included within your ration. Um, with all you feel um, rations, good quality ra um, ingredients are essential. So firstly, on the blue left-hand side, you will see protein ingredients. Um, you need high protein sources, sources such as soya bean meal, which I suppose is your Rolls Royce of proteins. And you want these, especially in the last two to three weeks of pregnancy and into early lactation to ensure the right quality and quantity of colostrum and milk is available to that lamb. All our proteins are available, and these include rapeseed, which may feature on feed labels more now. However, it should be limited due to its digestibility not being as good as soya and it's also lower in energy. You'll notice there that maize distillers has a wee star beside it as it can be classified as both protein and energy. However, it should be used at lower levels due to the risk of copper toxicity. In terms of energy sources, it should be made up of cereals, mainly maize, barley or wheat, beet pulp. Uh, you can see there is a useful source of energy as well as fiber. And in terms of other fibers, you have your soya holes, which will be seen in most rations. Yeah, the most important thing this year with the price of meal is to examine the feed label and see what exactly you're paying for. Um, it's not just not simply picking up the phone and asking what the protein level is and what is the price. Make sure you look at the label or get them to tell you what the individual ingredients are in the ration, especially protein, as this is more important than the actual protein um, gradient quality is actually more important than what is the overall protein level. Overall, with good quality proteins in the ration, you would be looking for a 16, 16 to 18% crude protein level and maybe higher for more prolific influx. Energy is important as well and levels aren't stated on feed labels, but we'd be looking at around or over 12.5 megajoules. 
Looking at the label, the gradients will be listed in descending order and with the highest level of inclusion stated first. So within a good ration, the, two, the top three ingredients should be soya bean meal. I would be looking for the ration to have at least 20% soya bean meal and then I also want to be see, um, sorry, I will be looking at the ration to have at least 20% soya bean meal in the ration or 200 kilograms to the tonne. And then we also want to see be seeing cereal grains such as either barley or maize in the top three as well. Beet pulp, as mentioned, is also relatively high ingredient, energy ingredient and fiber source. So, so keep a close eye, but also keep a close eye, eye out for filler ingredients that are low quality, such as sunflower or wheat feed, for example, as these should be avoided due to either poor protein or energy levels. Yes, salmon has moved on there to the, I suppose you can see there going back again. Um, The feed, um, the feed label. Yep, you can see there your high, um, high pro, um, soy at the topper and your maize and your barley. What you want to see, you'll see your um, rapeseed further on down the label, and as well as that there, um, if you see unwanted fillers, as I said, like your sunflower or wheat field, um, if you want to know how much roughly they make up of your ration, look out for molasses on the label, as this usually makes up three to five percent of the total ration. So if you see um, your unwanted fillers above or below this, you will know roughly its conclusion overall. You do not want to be see unwanted fillers contributing any more than 2% of your ration. Uh, just as us as advisors across the country, we're hearing from several farmers this year. We are noticing more are starting to home mix their own rations from barley or other crops they have grown on farm. Um, Here's an example of two rations, roughly 19% crude protein levels that can be mixed at home. It must be noted if you are a home mixing, that is a good option if you can guarantee a good steady supply of other straits for it to make up that ration. And this should last for the whole of late pregnancy and into early lactation period of the use, as you do not want to be changing ingredients during this period, as this will cause problems. You also want to make sure that you include a top quality mineral and vitamin mix for example, to be able to get that um, selenium, iodine, cobalt, and vitamin E, for example, into that U. As touched on earlier as well, in terms of body condition score, I am an importance of it as usual. And body condition score of ewes at lambing is important and something we do not want to let slip this year due to feeding. So just to reiterate, you can see at the bottom two lines of each category, whether it's hill or lowland, we want to keep a consistent body condition score from mid-pregnancy until lambing. If you're looking to increase your output from use in terms of numbers, for example, one of the key areas that play a role in this is that you need to have a consistent body condition score by not letting it increase or decrease rapidly as this will have long-term impacts. Yeah, this is the slide about, I suppose, looking at first quad um, silages um, in the program and across the country, me and all our advisors um, have seen, we've seen a number of silage results already this year, mainly from suckler or beef farms, which as you know, will be feeding silage already compared to the sheep farms. But just to give you an indication, the farmers involved in the sheep program, from James here tonight to the other eight members, they took samples of their silage a while back to get an early indication of quality before they start feeding. We can see from the James silage and the rest of the group um, silage that there are more weather side than we would like to, and which will impact intakes and but may also increase the chances of nebula prolapses, for example. Overall, like many around the country, energy and protein levels are down compared to previous years. Um, firstly, due to weather conditions during the growing growing period and delaying harvest by 10 days for many and not around that May, June time. And also in some cases reduced fertilizer applications than usually would be put on in previous years. This has impacted on protein levels as nitrogen plays a role in the protein levels in grasses. So is this slide here is just a summary of that there. Um, Sage is generally weather this year or cut later and this has impacted energy levels as you can see probably not 0.5 to 1 megajoules less than previous years. Silages are variable throughout, this, throughout the year so just be careful and get silage tested as soon as possible as more meal may be required to compensate for this and um, so get samples taken and get that formulated before the final month of pregnancy comes around. 
And again, um, as highlighted earlier, don't let a body condition score slip this year by thinking your silage quality is better than what it is and not feeding the yield correctly. So just in terms of how much so just in terms of how much you should be feeding the ewe this winter, the table here is an example of for a twin burn ewe of around 70 kilograms with a body condition score of three. It must be noted again, this is for a 70 kilogram ewe and we are now finding that many ewes are in the lowland especially are closer to 100 kilograms than 70. So these figures will need to be adjusted to whatever your mature weight of your ewe is in your farm as more meal will be required for these heavier ewes. For many this year, silage quality will more likely fall in that their medium quality section of around 10.7 mega um, ME. And you can see um, from four to six weeks out pre lama concentrate feeding will need to commence compared to, to excellent quality silage on the left. Um, overall, you can see a difference between the total fed over the six weeks period along the bottom pre lama and how silage quality influences this level of feed required. I know we cannot do anything about what silage quality we have now at the minute because it's all in the pits or in the bales, but going forward, this ta table demonstrates the importance of trying to aim for the best quality silage, especially with meal prices increasing. So just before we move on, you can see on the right-hand column, um, excellent quality bale silage in the right-hand column, as I say. You'll notice in comparison to excellent quality precision silage on the left-hand column, back again, that more meal has to be fed per ahead even though both silages have the same energy content of 11.7. In fact, more meal has to be fed per ahead for excellent build silage compared to medium quality precision silage. Um, the, the reason for this is the physical nature of the bales and that they are not chopped as fine as precision chop and this will reduce intakes of silage, therefore more meal is required to compensate for this. Yeah, finally, this slide here is just the implications of silage quality and the increase in meal prices, and I suppose shows why we should try to make excellent quality silage by cutting a few weeks earlier than usual. Again, as I said, I know we cannot change the quality of silage in the yard right now, but on the blue table, you can see how the cost to feed the ewe 20 kilograms of meal on a medium quality silage has increased from £5.50 ahead two years ago to £8.38 in this year for recent sheep meal prices being quoted of around £419 per tonne for 2022, whilst in 2020 it was around £275 a tonne. In comparison to good quality silage on the green table, if you were able to make this this year, very, that's very good. It would cost roughly £5.2p to feed the ewe instead of £8.38 compared to the medium quality silage. Um, difference doesn't sound much, but over a 200 ewe flock, this is a difference of it's £672. So again, just to reiterate the importance of trying to feed the ewe the best quality of silage. Yeah, just before I hand back to Sanon, another factor in nutrition, I suppose nutrient that is normally always forgot about is clean water. And I suppose as Daryl highlighted earlier um, about freezing conditions. A pregnant ewe can consume up to six litres of water per day in late pregnancy and up to eight to ten litres during lactation. I just know some people will maybe starting to lamb in the next few weeks. So check water troughs daily and if this cold spell continues, just make sure that the, no pipes are frozen and water is accessible. They can access um, the water and make sure it is clean. So that is all I have to say right now, folks. So um, thanks you very much for listening and I'll hand back to Senan for the tech home message from tonight and then the Q&A afterwards. Jack, thank you very much. Um, they, uh, very, very informative. I would say, folks, this has all been recorded, so um, we, you will have an opportunity to see this again. So as I say, as Jack has said, folks, just a couple of slides here that I just want to finish with. And then any questions you have, uh, please keep putting them through, and we'll have the final Q&A when this, when this wee bit's finished. Um, so basically, as I said there, you know, concentrates, yes, they're going to be dear this year, especially, as Jack has said, but there's no real substitute, unfortunately, at the minute, um, so we'll have to go with that. But as Jack said, beware what's on the label. Ask questions. Be careful. What you know for inferior products, you know fillers are not going to do it. Know the weight of your yews, and that's one of the things within the program farms that we have done a lot of is actually getting a handle on the weight of your yews because they say they can surprise you with the weight of them. So if you do have an opportunity when you are bringing them in for general handling, you know run them through the bridge if you can. 
meal feeding, as Jack has said, your scanning rate, which all hopefully everyone's doing, body condition score, which I uh, say in some cases has been um, has come back this year, and silage quality, which is obviously the, the big part of it. So what can you do about it? Like you know, possibly consider uh, maybe joining a, a meal group. You know, you may save a few pound there. Um, as I say, every bit will, will help the system. Get grass growing early. Obviously, you know some of the, say the farmers have done the soil analysis, um, putting out urea where it can. It is expensive, um, but obviously, as I said earlier, grass is the cheapest source in, in a in a sheep system. Um, you know, as I say, some of the farms have considered moving the lambing back and lambing outdoors. So that's maybe not for everyone, but it is something that uh, may be considered. But the final one I would just want to say on this: if you haven't done it before, please get your silage analysed. And please use that. Go to your advisor if you're in a BDG or whatever system you're in and feed the best silage to your yews. Um, if you don't know what's in it, you don't know how to counterbalance that. But um, that's just want to finish on that one. And the final slide to say before I uh, pass to Darl, uh, say, you know, these events, obviously, they're, they're, they're there. Um, you know, further information, obviously, on some of the other upcoming events is on basically the CAFRI website. Uh, and say we are a partnership, and obviously for further information, you know, uh, there's a journal website there as well. Uh, the program is is covered uh, every week, um, both in print and digital format. And also for our sponsors, uh, Dunbia, with market information, so their information is there as well. Um, and just finally, folks, as, as the program is coming to an end, we will be having a closing conference in February next year. Um, just a couple of dates for your diary, and I hope you, would, uh, hope you can attend either one of them. Um, on the first one on the 21st of February, which will be in Greenmount uh, at 7.30, and there'll be a second one in, in Oma on the 23rd of February as well. So uh, that will be featuring some of the, the host farmers and we're speaking of their experiences. Um, so hope you'll be able to join us for that. So folks, uh, that's the presentation bit. So just hand them back now to Darrell for the any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. Um, we've had a few questions come in there during Jack's last presentation um, to stimulate a bit of discussion now. So we'll just go through that before we finish. Jack, first one in here. Um, currently home mixing, but I'm open to the idea of changing. What is the the best way to feed yo's blend or pellet? And I suppose we heard James talking that he uses a pellet earlier. Um, direct that to yourself, Jack. I suppose probably the pallet, yes, it's uh, more expensive um, compared to your blend. Um, don't know roughly how much more expensive, but in terms of palatability, it's probably a better option. You know, they're getting exactly what you want and they're getting in that ration. And there's less sorting in the pallet compared to would be to a blend, for example. The yews aren't able to sort through that they're and um, the palate to get what they what they like if you know what i mean they're getting everything in that ingredient into them each bite bitefuls while your blend they're able supposed to sort the way through and pick out the bits they do like and leave the bits behind and then i suppose in terms of like minerals and vitamins um probably you know as well you're getting it in the palate as well probably more consistently compared to um your blend which probably hopefully should be mixed well but might be a little bit more dispersed through and then i suppose when it comes to storage as well like if you're getting them bags or blown into the bin and your blend is more likely more your ingredients probably will fall to the bottom of the bin or the bottom of the bag if you know what i mean and probably not as evenly distributed without the, throughout the mix if you know what i mean so i'll probably stick more towards the pallets because you know exactly the always getting what's exactly what you're eating yeah and i suppose another point jack it depends on how you're feeding as well, whether you're feeding, how you're feeding. team or maybe not a lot of people are, but there are sheep farmers yeah. that, that will be doing that. Uh, another question in here, uh, just about, you know, maybe a farm, Jack, that has a couple of different types of silages. Which would you prefer for pregnant ewes? Um, lower dry matter, but very high energy and um, protein. So that's a wetter silage with high protein, high energy, or drier silage with slightly lower, not bad, but uh, slightly lower energy and protein levels in it. I suppose there is always that maybe we debate about that. Um, do you feed the wetter stuff earlier on um, late pregnancy and see the um, drier stuff later on or the vice versa? 
So with the weather side is, yes, you have your better values on it, but you have to remember there's going to be reduced intakes from that there, um, more gut fill from the weather side and you're not going to get as much in from them. Um, when it goes with your dryer side if if there was good energy, goodish levels of energy and protein and it probably stick more to that there because you probably get more intakes from that there. And when you get closer to the end of pregnancy, um, last few weeks of it, you can you'll be top it up anyway with concentrates. So you're able to make sure you can top it up anyway. You'd be doing that step feeding. So you're making sure you're getting it into her anyway. So probably sway it probably towards a dry drier side just to help with NTEX and that last few weeks just to help with NTEX and ensure your concentrate will be able to help top up the ME and protein. But just have to be careful as well if how much concentrate you are stepping up with because you don't want to risk the acidosis or something like that there. So Yeah, so if possible use your weather side first. Aye. Yeah. Yeah. Um what have we next um question here don't mind who takes it. What is, obviously somebody is home mixing here. What is the cost effective replacement for sugar beet in a home mixed ration based on barley must be the main component of the, the ration? Yeah, uh, I can take that Daryl so I can. Uh, not say it's hugely familiar just with the current concentrate prices, but if you were to look at any of I, what I'd actually say is oats, if you get it, it would be very cost effective. Uh, it does very similar to soya hulls. Uh, it's the same ME, like tin pine, sorry, the same as beet, same in ME at tin pine five. But to me, it probably has, it probably is better than what it says on, on paper. Uh, good in regards fiber as well. Uh, soya hulls, if you could get it, but a lot of the dairy fellas have a lot of that bought forward, given where the cost is so I'm not just sure how available uh, that is uh, as Jack said if you could get your hands and corn gluten maize gluten it's not too bad uh, rapeseed meal to a certain extent people often rapeseed meal gets a very I suppose bad name because we think of the energy content uh, and it's often put in as a filler uh, just for the protein side but it can have a good role to play as well in a balanced in a balanced uh, say ration but at 300, I think the last price I seen was 330 pound a ton. Uh, and that was a month ago, which was getting on the high side for including that, unless you're going to get the protein value out of it. But uh, it's something we'll, we might take the, the name of that, say, person who asked the question, Daryl, and we can, we can, uh, I'll be talking to Kieran as well tomorrow. He just couldn't make it on this evening, but he's been following up on straights, I know, for a story for next week. But that's generally the sort of ballpark where you'd be. Okay. Let's stay it on. Um, what else do we have here? Another sort of nutrition based question for whoever wants to take it. Uh, what about hay? We talked a lot about silage there. Um, there was. There was a very wet spring all right early on, but there was plenty of opportunities throughout um, maybe July, especially up here uh, um, towards June, maybe making where hay was made. What's the thoughts there on, on pregnant ewes um, and hay? Yeah, uh, I don't mind taking it when I <laughs> have the floor there. Uh, I suppose hay is a bit like oats in that it's, it's sort of, it's, it's often underestimated the value of it as well. In that if you take, just say if we're, if we're saying about maintaining condition, and if we're taking, say, silage DMD of 67 to 70 is perfect for maintenance feeding, hay of 60 DMD will do the same by merit of the fact that it's more palatable, it's a higher, uh, in general now I'm saying, it's a higher dry matter intake, where hay maybe gets a small bit tricky is in late pregnancy and higher litter sizes, uh, but definitely no issue with, with uh, mid-pregnancy feeding. And there's a lot of hay, as you say, on the ground this year, uh, but there's also a lot of poor quality hay. So it's like you said and said, test to know like. Yeah, there could be the odd rush through the odd bale here and there. Darn, you never know. <laughs> There, there could be an odd bit of free bedding in it, Darren. <laughs> yeah, but. what's left will make up the bedding. <laughs> um, right, if, if nobody else has anything to add on to that there. Uh, a question here, just 
I suppose slipping off winter nutrition, going back to the, the springtime. Uh, before Jack done his presentation, we were talking about James yourself and uh, the paddocks. Uh, I currently have, I'm just going to read out the question. I currently paddock graze yews and lambs. Each batch will be moved every four days and back into the first paddock within 21 days. I find it hard to keep sheep clean on fresh grass. Grass? Grass? <laughs> is there anything I can do about this or is it a common problem? I suppose, James, let me just ask you, first of all, did you notice that when you moved to the paddock grazing with, with maybe fresher grass and then on to, to Darn or Sanon or, or Jack about is there anything that can be done? We noticed it going on to lambs or lambs going on to second cut after grass there this year. Very hard to keep them clean on the fresh grass and we actually moved them on to older swards and they cleaned up then. So. Yeah. Well, I suppose maybe it's just a, a negative you have to deal with, with with getting that good nutrition into them. But is there anything that can be done, uh, Darren, Sennon? Well, the one thing I would just say, obviously, that that just to rule out that either it isn't a, a worm issue. Um, you know, I know we haven't mentioned here, but obviously animal health is a big part of it. And, you know, just to rule that out, that, um, you know, fecal egg counts, um, should be done just to make sure it's not a, a worming issue that's causing. But I know you know the worms can be shown without uh, lambs being dirty, so you know you can't assume assume that either. You know I don't know, Darren, if you've any other. I can't really think what. Sorry, Darren. I have to apologise. My connection cut there for one second. If you can ask that question again, sorry. If you're just uh, a listener, is talking about you know having the paddock system with. Basically, fresh, strong grass coming for, for ewes and lambs, ewes and lambs, I assume, can't keep the sheep clean. Um, is there anything can be done about it, or is that just a negative that comes with the positive of good growth? Um, I suppose Sennon just mentioned, just to rule it out, that it's not worms. But Yeah, yeah look at that. The, that's that's unfortunate. It's it's probably, look at one of the one of the things that the intensive grazing systems are seeing it even on the dairy side now, where they have say the whole cop and cow issue from twenty years of intensive grazing, it's it's just one of the downsides. If it if it is a warm issue, look at as a higher propensity to worms. But what I would be saying is because we take it that this farmer is probably dawson if he's if he's doing all on paddocks and everton. What I would suspect possibly is uh, and my fear would be maybe that his warmer isn't working uh, to, to 100 percent. And we've seen that in Trevor Nixon, one of our program farmers that we had a webinar on uh, sometime last year where he was doing everything right. Sheep was finding it impossible to keep clean. He was coming in and dosing them, but his warmer was only about 58, 60 percent effective. Yeah. And essentially, once he switched over, and he's been watching it sort of very close uh, by since I'd say that'd be where I'd be just checking first just to make sure. Right, that's that on. Uh, final question, looking at time here, folks. Um, what lactic acid level in silage would require feeding a rumen buffer such as acid buff? Yep, uh, I can make a comment on it, Daryl, won't, won't have the exact answer. But I wouldn't necessarily be as worried about the last lactic acid level in silage. Now, does uh, I can contradict myself on this in that there's an awful lot, say, in the industry where they talk about uh, the lactic acid and acid buffs. On the silage side, it isn't it isn't as detrimental as far as say I'd be saying that it's more so that if you had it coming from a real rapid breakdown in feed, or if you're feeding a very high starchy feed. Uh, or there was something gone wrong in your diet, that's, that would be more so. I wouldn't essentially be as worried, or I'd be sort of more worried on if, if your last lactic acid was very low, what, what effect does it have on palatability, or, or, or why your lactic acid level is that low, and what the dry matter is. That I'd, You'd probably need a bit more information to go into that exactly, Darren, to see what it is. That's right. maybe the, the, the listener's question. Well, that's brilliant, Darren. Um, look, I, we'd hope to be wrapped up within an hour and a half, folks, and we're coming close to nine o'clock. So, um, 
think that's going to be us for discussion tonight. That's the, the end of our event. And I hope all the listeners found it uh, informative and useful. If there's any BDG members out there that's listening and you have any further questions, get in contact with your with your BDG advisor or, or even Sennon himself. Uh, any wider questions about the programme, don't hesitate to get in touch with Sennon or, or Darren or any of the, the programme shareholders um, in Dumbia, Caffrey or the Irish Farmers Journal. And you can also visit everybody's, all those people's uh, websites to find out more about the information. And Sennon's already mentioned the conferences, so there's nothing left for me to say only thank yous for coming. I hope he's got something out of it. Thank you to all the speakers, especially James for opening up the farm. And thank you to the attendees for listening. And I hope you all have a Merry Christmas and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. And good night.